started even though not many people have showed up yet we're gonna there's people pulling in as we speak uh, Hawaiian time but we should uh, get rolling for the online guys and uh, so that we honor the time we posted as much as possible uh, let me go ahead and start us off with a word of prayer and uh, we just get into it Heavenly Father thank you so much once again for this uh, time to dive into uh, your word. Um, thank you for the messages we've already uh, heard so far through uh, Psalms and through Job. Uh, thank you for addressing questions like suffering um, and exile uh, so that we can lean on you and uh, know that it's all in your hands, Father. I just pray as we continue to dive into these wonderful books and see how they're tied together beautifully by you, your hands, Lord. Um, that we would just be in awe and wonder of you. May your spirit guide our conversation uh, and may it be glorified to you. In your sins name we pray. Amen. All right, so last time, I'll, I'll reiterate it um, to anyone who didn't hear it. This is uh, streaming on YouTube and uh, our website, tallhailmissionary.com. And it usually is streaming on Facebook, but we just had a, a Facebook failure right now, so I don't know what's going on with that, but Facebook shut down our streaming uh, service, so it won't be on Facebook for now. We'll, we'll share the link to our website instead. But underneath all of those uh, live streams is also a link to the Zoom, so that if you guys have questions online, you could follow the Zoom um, link and the password is just KMC, it's posted right below it, and you could actually, we could hear you through the sound system right now. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, join us on Zoom and uh, ask your questions. You can either type it out or just speak and we can hear you. All right, I'll hand it over to Ray. Great. We'll get back into it. Good, thank you, Curtis. Um, we are going through our Ketu Beam series, last, and uh, we started last night. And one of the things that uh, I mentioned, I think several times, but perhaps not as clearly as I could have, should have, is that uh, those people back then, well, they were still awaiting for a Messiah to come. Whereas we here today, we live post-Christmas, post-Advent. So we might think, okay, those books uh, really deal with the, their situation back then. But our situation now is somewhat different. Except what they were looking for, especially as they went into captivity, was to have all of their hopes finally realized with the coming of Messiah. Now Messiah has come. Have all of our hopes today been realized? And the answer is no. 
No, though he came to establish the kingdom, the kingdom that he set up is kind of an upside down, inside out sort of a kingdom where he's ruling over everything, although he doesn't seem to be the one who got elected in our last presidential election. And it doesn't seem like, like Jesus is ruling from a throne over Russia right now. Or pick any other nation that you want to across the globe. Is Jesus' kingdom here? Well, yes, in an invisible sort of way. And yet, like those people back then, we're still waiting for Jesus. He lives in our hearts, and yet we haven't seen him, his kingdom, visibly set up for us to be able to experience this, this kingdom of shalom, of peace. So we're living just as much in anticipation of the coming of Messiah as they were. They didn't understand, of course, that it was going to be in two stages. They probably should have if they had read their Bibles a bit more carefully. But uh, we'll talk about that on the 22nd and on the 29th in the Sunday morning service. Well, I'll be talking about Luke 24 and what they should have known from the scriptures. All right. Um, so I don't find it any accident at all that some of our Christmas songs, if you stop and think about it, uh, joy to the world. No more let sin or sorrows, what's the word there? No more let sin or sorrows, does it grow? Or thorns infest Rain. the ground. Have any of you ever experienced thorns in the ground? Yeah, we have to pull them out of our feet all the time, right? Guess what? Joy to the world is actually singing about the end times as much as it is about Christmas. And when we sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, an older Christmas song, it is very appropriate to, to see it as a Christmas song. And yet... We can sing it for us today because we are awaiting with Maranatha in our minds. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So the Ketuvim, the writings, are not literature just intended for people long ago. They're intended for all of us who live between the times. The author of Hebrews makes this really clear. <coughs> When he says that today, we're not landed citizens. We are people on the move. We are pilgrims and aliens. Or as one of the old gospel choruses used to go, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. This isn't really our permanent place of citizenship, says Paul in the book of Philippians. And Peter even takes it further and, and says, she who is in Babylon, we find ourselves in Babylonian context, not geographically, but in terms of longing for redemption from all the world powers that are not friendly to God and his kingdom. So the Ketuvim I see is especially timely for us living on this side of Christ's return. Okay? Um, that just by way of introduction. Now, again, I really like the dialogue. The questions and comments and thoughts and, and whatever. Uh, anybody have any questions or thoughts at this point? Okay. Um, if so, anywhere along the line, please just jump in and let me know. All right. So tonight we're going to be looking at three books, Proverbs, Ruth, and Song of Solomon. Okay. That's actually a lot of chapters, if you stop and think about it. 
On the other hand, do you realize last night we talked about, we spent almost an hour of introduction and then we talked about Psalms and Job and that was 192 chapters, right? Talk about flying through the scriptures here. But I am trying to give you a big picture, an overview. So, um, before I do uh, get right into Psalms, this is going to be a, a review for maybe a few of you uh, who have heard me talk about Bible study methods in the past. And uh, I've given this uh, quite a bit of thought, how best to study the Bible. Um, <laughs> that would be its own separate course. And I know that some of you have actually spent quite a bit of time actually working through those materials. So, as I understand it, there are three types of literature in the Bible. Three major categories. And the whole Bible, from chapter to chapter to chapter, will fit into one of these three categories. Okay? Um, does anyone know what those three types of literature might be, Cassie? <laughs> Narrative. <laughs> Narrative. Poetry and discourse. Thank you. All right. You passed. You can move up into the front row now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, <coughs> narrative refers to all those texts of the Bible that is making its point, is teaching its theology, but through story. Right? Just because it's story does not mean it's not uh, asserting truths. But the way that it asserts truths is different than in the other two types of literature. So narrative is a text that makes its point by telling a story. Poetry is a text where normal language is modified somehow to intensify its impact. Now, of the three... Poetry is by far the hardest to define because it's different from one language to another, from one culture, from one uh, historical period to the next. A haiku does not read at all like a Shakespearean sonnet, okay? But they're both poetry. How can they both be poetry? In both cases, they end up in some sense, compressing language, adding a lot more figures of speech, and then often they end up do <coughs> doing other unique things. There was a, an American poet, I don't know how long ago he lived, probably half a century at least, uh, E.E. E. Cummings. And one of the most remarkable things about E.E. E. Cummings' writings was that he never used capital letters, and he never used any punctuation at all. So think text message. <laughs> All right, way before we had texting, okay? Um, an echo there, Curtis? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so there's all kinds of different variations that people can introduce, rhyming, is not the normal way that we talk. Um, with a, speaking with a rhythm or a cadence called meter is also not something that's part of our, our normal communication. Those are the kinds of things that we do encounter in poetry. Now, poetry in the Bible, Hebrew poetry, also has lots of figures of speech. But it doesn't rhyme the sounds like in Dr. Seuss, nor does it have the kind of rhythm like a limerick. I'm just making sounds, but you can already tell it's poetry, right? That's the cadence that we give to a limerick, right? Biblical poetry does not have that. And we should be glad because neither sound rhyming nor meter survives translation. As soon as you read it in another language, those kinds of elements are lost. 
okay? So I've read Dante's Inferno, but actually it wasn't written in English. And the translators had a very uh, daunting task in front of them to translate it from an old Italian kind of language into English and still do justice to both the, the rhythm and the poetry. And sometimes I'm sure that they had to take real <laughs> liberties with the meaning that Dante was actually talking about so that they can make it fit right poetically. Again, thankfully, Hebrew poetry, biblical poetry, comes across in the English intact. Because what it does is it rhymes, not words or sounds, but thoughts. The fancy term for this is called parallelism, right? So we are dealing with a number of books of poetry as we are reading in the Ketuvim. We started off with a book of Psalms, which is all poetry. And if you look at this very carefully at all, on a verse by verse basis, the lines are almost always in couplets, sometimes in triplets, okay? Um, a single line is called a colon. Two lines working together are a bicola, or you can have a tricola, right? Which sounds like an ad to me for a soft drink, but anyway. Um, that's poetry. We saw it in Psalms. We see it in Job. But Job is a unique one because we have a narrative beginning to the book for two chapters. And then it quits being a story. And what it turns into is actually a discourse, a text which systematically presents an idea or series of ideas. And each one of his friends steps up and presents logical arguments. But it's also at the same time poetry with parallelism in it. So in order to read the book of Job skillfully, you actually need to know what to look for when you're reading narrative and also poetry and also discourse. So it makes it one of the more difficult books of the Bible to read. All right, those are the two that we looked at so far. <coughs> Tonight we're going to be looking at Proverbs, which is what type of literature? Poetry. Poetry. And we're going to look at Ruth, which is narrative. And then we're going to look at Song of Solomon, which is poetry again, okay? So, what type of writing is proverbial literature? Actually, proverbial wisdom literature can be any of these three, as we saw with the book of, of different kinds of writings within the Ketuvim. All right, now besides identifying three main types, as I read from verse to verse, there are often, there are also genres. And I identify seven genres. And these are the seven. Apocalyptic, epistle, gospel, prophecy, psalm, story, and proverbial. Now, this is not the same thing as type because there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between them. In apocalyptic literature, for instance, uh, like the book of Revelation, you can end up with narrative portions. There is a storyline. And the book of Revelation actually concludes the story of the entire Bible. And yet there are also discourses. It's written in the form of an epistle. And yet there are also poetic inserts that are usually praises to God. 
so that we see in the book of Revelation a whole bunch of things that have in the history of the church been put to music like the hallelujah chorus comes right out of the book of Revelation or a more contemporary song that we have been singing maybe for the last 10 years or so is called the Revelation song okay uh, how many songs can you think of say holy 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 there's a bunch of those or worthy is the lamb it's all over the place okay so apocalyptic can be any of the three types but not at the same time it's going to be one type of literature in any given passage even though all of Revelation fits into apocalyptic each one of these has its own unique characteristics now I'm dealing with some kind of complex things here I want to make sure you're tracking along so far questions yes is proverbial a new um, genre because I don't remember reading about it in your book but yes. is that like w wisdom genre or something? yeah good catch okay. so um I have written a textbook that goes through all of this. It's called Read the Bible for a Change. That is, a changed life. All right. In that, I discussed the seven different genres, except I had wisdom in there instead of proverbial. Um, this summer, I'm revising the book. And this is one of the biggest changes that I'm making. I think that the term wisdom literature um, is complicated it's not nearly as straightforward as we think All right, so think with me for a moment wisdom literature what books of the Bible do we typically associate with wisdom literature Proverbs, Proverbs. yes Job. Job and the other one is actually no Ecclesiastes those are the three that most people all say are the wisdom literature but if we look at ancient manuscripts we never see those three books together they were never grouped together and in fact and this came as a surprise to me but the first time the term wisdom literature was ever used was in the 1850s by a German critical scholar. Um, so the church managed to get by for almost 19 centuries, well, over two th uh, 20 centuries without ever operating with that as being a category. Also, the style of writing between Job and Ecclesiastes is really quite different. Okay, so um, maybe a better term would be to say they operate with wisdom being an important topic or theme but they're poetic they're in couplet lines and that's why I've gone with proverbial okay Tamara uh, we need a microphone in your hand it's got to be on is it turned on there you go are you going to give us um like characteristics of proverbial um, because I look at proverbs and I see lots of different is the whole thing is the whole is all of proverbs proverbial yes other than arguably the, the very beginning of the book which is just a superscription okay are you going to give us characteristics uh, as I talk about proverbs yes okay. yes I am okay stay tuned Okay, so what of these seven, what genre of writing is proverbial literature? Okay, try not to overthink this. What do you think it would be? Proverbial, proverbial thank you. Okay, um, <laughs> it's the obvious answer, right? Okay, thank you, Captain. <laughs> All right, so typically, 
and what, this is what I was just talking about with Cassie here. Typically, wisdom literature has been thought to include Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Some people might try to shoehorn Song of Solomon in there. Uh, others would say there's a few Psalms that read like the book of Proverbs, like Psalm 37, Psalm 145. These are not prayers to God. They're not songs. They sound just like they came out of the book of Proverbs. Okay. Um, Song of Solomon, again, I, I mentioned that some of them um, include that. Jesus' parables are also, by some, included in wisdom literature. Now, that might seem like a little bit of a stretch, but the Hebrew word for a proverb is a mashal. The book of Proverbs is called mashlim. The Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek about 200 years before the time of Jesus. Okay, anyone know the, what that was, translation was called? The Septuagint. The Septuagint. So what is the title of the book of Proverbs in the Septuagint? Parabole. From which we get the word parable. When Jesus came speaking in parables, he was giving Proverbs-like truth. Truths that you had to ponder because they weren't stated flat out. What is the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan, of the prodigal son? Um, each of these parables require pondering and thought. And that's one of the characteristics, Tamara, of proverbial literature. Is that until, instead of telling you the truth in propositions, it forces you to think, what did that mean? And isn't that how the people responded to Jesus' parables? Half of them, at least, didn't get it. And Jesus intentionally spoke to them in sort of a secret code language, parables, that could only be understood by those who were really willing and wanting to understand. But to the rest, they remained uh, difficult. <laughs> I actually think it was a stalling tactic because very frequently the parables are a sharp critique of the leaders in Jesus' day and by the time they figured out, I've just been dissed. He was already beyond rock throw distance. He was safe. Okay? So he evaded people who understood it too quickly. <clears throat> so traditionally, these are, are the wisdom books. Proverbial, I think, temptation. All right? Was that true? Well, Psalm 91 was true. How Satan was using it was not right. Okay. In the book of Proverbs, what we have are things that are true most of the time. And that's why they're valuable. If you can't make generalizations ever, then you're going to end up repeating uh, errors over and over again because there were slight differences each time. All right. Even if I'm reading biblical case law, what do you do if your ox gets out and gores your neighbor? All right. You are supposed to accept the responsibility for that, right? But suppose it was your goat. The Bible never says anything about a goat. Or anything about when your two-year-old child somehow figures out the locking mechanism on the shift lever and pulls it from park into neutral on a slanted driveway and your vehicle 
goes down the driveway across the road and into the side of a bright red Chevy Beretta. Does that have anything to do with your ox goring your neighbor? And yes, we had to pay for all the repairs, as we should have. Okay. <laughs> Two years old, he's already had an accident. Okay. Um, so Proverbs, my bigger point here, Proverbs are true most of the time, but there are exceptions. So actually, we are given the exception before we're given the rules, which is the book of Proverbs. Okay, other questions here? All right. Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Boy, was he ever wrong. Because that's not what my Bible tells me. My Bible tells me that wisdom begins with the fear of Yahweh. That's the beginning of wisdom. Okay? So before I go any further, let's pull out our Bibles, finally. And I want to read to you the opening verses of the book of Proverbs. It starts off, the Proverbs, Mashle, of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. That's this little prologue that I mentioned doesn't really fit the poetic. But pretty much the rest of the book is going to work that way. Uh, a few interesting things about this. First of all, I know that the entire book of Proverbs is not all written by Solomon. How much it was, of a, was written by Solomon? I'm not exactly sure. We can look at the superscripts. We notice that there are 30 sayings of the wise, which actually go across multiple chapters later on in the book. <clears throat> we have a chapter that is written by Agur, whoever that is, but he gave us Proverbs 30. And then we have in the last chapter, Proverbs 31, the sayings of King Lemuel, except there never was a king of Israel or Judah named Lemuel. Well, we don't know him from history of any other nations. Um, He's just someone who pops in an appearance. And actually, he didn't write the chapter. His mom did. These are the Proverbs of King Lemuel's mom. Okay, and that's how the book ends. All right, but we have a superscription here that starts off. We should be thinking Solomon, who is sharing with us his wisdom. Now, Solomon is a a difficult character in the Bible to figure out. Uh, I think he's one of the most aggravating people, uh, characters of the entire Bible because he seems to be very astute about some things and really stupid when it comes to skillful living. Now, how do you define wisdom? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge in English? And typically people will say, well, knowledge is, well, it's like what you know. Okay. And wisdom is putting it into practice well. Okay. Knowledge tells us that tomatoes are actually a fruit. Wisdom tells us, don't put them in your fruit salad anyway. Right? It's taking the knowledge and applying it in the right way, in the right kind of circumstances. So here's Solomon. Boy, is he ever a smart writer 
who becomes a terrible liver. Right? And now we're looking at a book of Proverbs, at least quite a bit of which is attributed to this guy. And rather than saying, Solomon's a great hero, look at how many books of the Bible he gave us, we're saying, Solomon? Why did God use Solomon? Isn't he the guy who, when God said, don't have too many horses, went out and got himself 12,000 of them? And when God said, especially not horses from Egypt, he imported them from Egypt. And when God said, don't get lots of gold and silver, he went out and... This is outside of, <laughs> outside of what I'm talking about, but it's an interesting curiosity. You know how much gold he got every year? The number is 666 talents of gold annually. Next time you happen to be reading, say, in the book of Revelation, and you come across the number 666, instead of looking at the newspapers, your social security card, your visa card. Try just looking at the Bible. And I think the number 666 is trying to set up a Solomonic kingdom of peace and economic security, of um, putting an end to war, but doing so at the cost of completely blowing off what Deuteronomy says a king is supposed to be like. Right? So we have Solomon, who's identified here. And does it bother me that Solomon is attached to the book of Proverbs? Well, here's what it does. It makes me think, hmm, I wonder why God would choose such a man for this kind of information. Did you see what God just did to me? He made me think about wisdom. I have to stop and ponder this. Instead of just taking it at face value, I have to think about this. And then I realize, oh yeah. And you know what? God could also speak through a donkey. <laughs> he has a track record of using people who weren't really worthy of being used whom he did use for his own glory and purposes. So, do I hate Solomon? <sighs> well, all I can say is that at the end of his life, God evaluates him. And this is, you can find it in 2 Kings, or 1 Kings rather. Um, and also in Second Chronicles. God looks at his life and he did evil in God's eyes. And that's the bottom line. Even though from evil people can sometimes come really good things. And have any of you ever encountered a non-Christian who is actually a pretty wise person? And I'm guessing that most all of you can think of that. Someone who actually lived with integrity and character. Okay. All right. So a second feature. Oh, I was reading Proverbs. Sorry, I interrupted myself here. Let's go back. Proverbs 1.1. 1, 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, exclamation mark, son of David, king of Israel. Uh, let me skip down for just a moment to verse 8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you. Verse 15. My son, do not go along with them. All right. Solomon here is giving advice to his son. This is not just a father's advice. This is the royal messianic line the royal heir giving advice to just any old boy? No, he's giving advice to someone who's going to be next in line as the messianic heir. And he gives them advice. Except, have you read the story of Solomon and his son? Anyone even remember what his son's name was? 
It was Rehoboam. And what is the most important thing that you might know about Rehoboam? When he was given good advice, hey, these people have been taxed to death. Will you please repeal the taxes and, uh, and take this onerous tax burden off of, off of us? He didn't like that advice, even though it was wise people who gave it to him. And so he went and set out, set out to find the counsel of his peers, age-wise. And they said, well, what you need to do is show them who's boss. You go and tell them, if you thought what my, my father did, I'm going to make it even tougher. That will let them know who's in charge here. And that decision split the kingdom in two. And that's where we have the northern kingdom seeding apart from the southern kingdom of Judah. All right. So think about this for a moment. Here is Solomon giving advice to whom? Rehoboam. Was he good at giving fatherly advice? Well, I don't know who to blame, blame there. <coughs> was, it Solomon's, uh, was it Solomon's issue or was it Rehoboam's? And I tend to think that it was Rehoboam's because after all, this is in the Bible and we're supposed to be learning from it uh, at a larger level. So what he's saying are things that are truth but end up being rejected by his son. And <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, thank you. Ah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> and so we end up um, realizing that Rehoboam didn't take this advice. I wonder what kind of a person would listen to the wise advice that we encounter in the book of Proverbs. Well, probably the kind of son who would learn wisdom at a very early age and actually grow in that knowledge. Someone who is a son of the king. And I'm remembering that I just read the book of Psalms where God says, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. This day I have become your father. You are my son. So I'm thinking that maybe Jesus might be the kind of ideal reader but we are all called to be Christ-like, aren't we? So would it be good for us to follow the advice of Proverbs? Yes, much better than Solomon, who was merely the human author. And I'm listening to the real king as a child of God, as sons and daughters. Okay, questions or comments or thoughts here? All right, I realized it was just, <laughs> this was big stuff here. Um, I had a question. Sure, go for it. Online. Um, not directly related, but kind of. Uh, I'll read it directly. Um, she says, was the book of Job and the teaching of the truth, it's not always because of sin that we suffer, setting up us Jesus? Yes. Yes, so we have a righteous sufferer. We were actually already prepared for that because of Isaiah. Remember what we said about that? But now we come <clears throat> into uh, the book of Job. Uh, clearly he's this righteous sufferer. When we turn now to the book of, well, even in Psalms, we see someone who is suffering way out of proportion and uh, I realize that this is last year's lectures on Psalms. But I see Jesus as being that ultimate sufferer in the book of Psalms. So much so that the of David, I really take as the primary referent to be Jesus. 
Uh, I'm not alone in, in all of this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many of you have heard of him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer read the entire book of Psalms as being the prayer book of Jesus. So we think of the Lord's Prayer being Matthew 6 and uh, being half a dozen verses. Bonhoeffer, if he had his way, would have turned the whole book of Psalms into red font for those of you who have a red letter edition of the Bible. These are the prayers that Jesus prayed. Lots more I can say about that. Um, Curtis, did you want to follow up on that question at all? I'll let you know if she does. Okay. Good. All right, any others? Okay, yes, go ahead. Shannon, right? Okay. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay. So, um, so the son that is being spoken to then is the messianic king. A little bit louder, I'm sorry. So the son that's being referred to is, is Jesus, if, if I'm hearing you right. So yeah, I'm jumping way ahead, and it would take me a long time actually to, to build the entire case. Okay, sorry. But I'm giving you bottom line because we've only got about an hour to talk about it. Okay. So. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, so who is, um, is it Solomon then that's writing this, or is, is there an, another author that we should be looking at? Um, how to answer this most helpfully. I think that the, that the way that the Bible comes to us, if we're reading the text itself, tends to move the series of questions from the human author and the historical circumstances more and more onto the divine author who doesn't have a particular historical background. And so studies that devote themselves a lot to, well, you need to understand the ancient Israelite culture, I would agree only insofar as I need to understand the story of the entire Bible. But I'm not overly enamored with getting into cultural backgrounds because God didn't reveal that as his inspired truth. And my hands are full enough with the inspired truth and in trying to understand it that has occupied my attention for a lifetime and I think there's just diminished returns in doing those other things. Now, I didn't start out like that. Uh, believe me, I have put in my time and effort in understanding historical background stuff. But something happened to me after returning from doing graduate study at a school in Jerusalem. And I realized for all the wonderful things that I'd learned, and I don't regret going one bit, for all the things that I'd learned, there wasn't a single passage that I could think of that now had a theological truth that was different than what I had originally thought. How it related to circumstances, that part I grew in, but not in terms of what I feel like I have to stand before God and give an account for. I don't think I'm going to have to give an account for how well I understood my Iron Age 2 period. Okay. So, was Solomon the author? Uh, as I read Second or First Kings, probably of a bunch of Proverbs. Are they all in the book of Proverbs? Probably not. He probably thought of a bunch of other ones as well. These are the ones that have been put into Scripture along with Proverbs from other sources, from authors. We don't even know what century, what country they came from. And yet they're in the Bible. And as they come to be in the Scriptures, they kind of transcend all the, the ancient historical context and they become relevant for us here and now. Okay. Good question. Uh, I tried to make it short. <laughs> would, would, you, would you also uh, <clears throat> extend that to the Psalms, which we talked about last night, which I heard, I heard you say 
were all written during the time of the exile. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, could those have also been written during this time, maybe compiled during the time of the exile? You know, um, would those have been, some of those have been David's psalms that he wrote? Yeah, gr um, great question. And I perhaps didn't phrase it as clearly as I should have. So, for instance, you were talking about Psalm 122, I believe. Psalm 122 is in a larger section of 120 through 134. Who put the collection of Psalms together as a book? Well, it wasn't David, because there are actually a number of places in the Psalms that talk about the destruction of the temple. And by the waters of Babylon, we hung our harps. So we had somebody being guided by God in this whole process, assembling all of this information that may have come from the very pen of David, but now it's being given a context. And the context is not even just the book of Psalms, but the book of Psalms after we have read the former prophets uh, the Torah and the former prophets and the latter prophets. And now we turn to the book of Psalms and we know all this story already. And we can appreciate all these things that happened to David, maybe way back further. <sighs> Again, I might be getting myself in trouble because I'm telling you too much too fast. But maybe there were times when David personally was undergoing suffering and that prompted him to write a psalm with this in mind. If I'm suffering and I'm a broken sinner, when the righteous one comes, how much more will he suffer? And so as he's undergoing hard times, he's writing psalms that might be discussing in a superficial way his issues, but he's really writing it about the sufferings of Jesus. He's writing as a prophet. Now you might be thinking, whoa, that's a huge stretch. What do you mean he's writing as a prophet? When is David ever called a prophet? Right? I'm glad you asked that. In Acts chapter 2. Oh, Peter calls him a prophet. <coughs> yes. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 2, the sermon on Pentecost, he says, but David was a prophet and seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the sufferings of Messiah his death and that God would not abandon him to the grave. And David wasn't writing about himself and that's Peter's point. And David was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. He's still dead. But David was writing about somebody else and that somebody else was Jesus. Go ahead. It, no, it really helped to understand that maybe there was a collection at that time of yes. the exile where we collect all these psalms, where we collect the Proverbs. You know, yes. Um, one of the things that leads me to believe that Solomon was the author of a number of the Proverbs is because that's what he asked for God to give him. When God said, what do you want? And, and Solomon said, in a dream, he said, <clears throat> I, I want to be able to discern how can I lead your people Israel? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I have no discernment. I, I by myself I can't do it and God says you're right you can't do it so I'll give you wisdom to do it and because you asked for wisdom I'm going to give you and, and, the, and the story goes on but right. the Proverbs are also collected at that point this is my point yeah so actually the former prophets Joshua through Kings were all collected as a single unit but they couldn't have been collected until after the last event that's written about which is the destruction of Jerusalem in 2 Kings 25 so uh, Solomon would never have read 1 and 2 Samuel much less 1 Kings so we have a later perspective looking back on that. And this is Steve, right? That I'm talking to? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so 
I had something pointed out to me, oh man, maybe a dozen years or so ago, that was kind of a head slap moment. Um, did Solomon pray for wisdom? And if I read the text really carefully, I realize Solomon had a dream. And in his dream, he prayed for wisdom. Is that the same thing? That's, that's correct. That's what I'm referencing. Yeah, but, and this is why I find Solomon so aggravating, but God does give him wisdom because the rest of the chapter tells us this story about the two fighting mothers and his wisdom with, you know, and proposing slicing the baby in two, and then his reputation for wisdom going out to the other nations. Uh, he was given wisdom, even though I'm not convinced he actually prayed for it. Now, there's a parallel account. The parallel account is in Chronicles, and I told you already, Chronicles theology is really different than what we find in Kings. Even though it's talking about the same people and the same events, it does so from a really different perspective. And guess what? Solomon gets a makeover. Solomon looks way better in Chronicles than he comes across. And David does too. Uh, David and Bathsheba, never read it in Chronicles. Even though the whole book of First Chronicles is about David. It's kind of a big oversight, isn't it? Uh, but Chronicles is improving. And I think we've got the same thing with Solomon going on here. So again, I find Solomon just a very vexing character. Do I think the book of Proverbs is inspired? Yes. I have no question it's God's word. How much of it was Solomon's word? I'm not real sure. Uh, but we should at least be thinking, oh, Solomon didn't do such a good job of putting wisdom into practice. And all this advice that he gives to his son didn't work. So however bad Solomon was at it, Rehoboam was worse. And I need to keep that in mind, actually, for as a caution. Don't blow off the pursuit of wisdom. It can have devastating consequences. Okay. Great thoughts, good yeah, insights. Fair enough. Good. Fair enough, thank you. You bet. Others? Okay. So we're still talking about how is wisdom characterized? <laughs> I was reading in Proverbs, that's right. Let me go back to reading in Proverbs. We have not gotten very far through this passage, like verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel... What is the purpose of the book? Now, this is really the only book that I can think of in the Bible that lays out its purpose right at the very outset. I mean, Luke does a bit, but he doesn't reveal all of his cards. Proverbs 1, 2. For attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, for doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. The word beginning is reshit. And it's the basic root word that we find in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning. That's one way to think of it literally means head. So, at the head, God created the heavens and the earth. At the head, what does that mean? And most often it has been interpreted to be at the head of time. 
And so it gets translated as, as at the beginning. But another way to think of it is uh, instrumentally. That is, where is the source? So that we could read Genesis 1-1 as by means of the head, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, why would I be making a, a big deal about this translational option that seems to be a minority view? Because I'm quite certain that's how Paul read that verse. He calls Christ the head over all creation. All right. So maybe we should read it this way. The fear of Yahweh is the source of all wisdom. Not beginning in terms of time, but rather we keep coming back to the source that generates all this. So we even use that word in English some like that as the headwaters of a river. That's the source from which all the rest comes. Okay. So this is a very important hermeneutical introduction. And by the way, I'm jumping ahead of myself. But in the end of Ecclesiastes, the last two verses read, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Boils it all down. If you grow weary in reading the book of Ecclesiastes, just jump to the end. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For he, God, will bring everything into judgment along with every secret thing, whether it's good or whether it's evil. Okay. So we have kind of a book ending between Proverbs and the end of, of the beginning of Proverbs and the end of Kohelet or Ecclesiastes. Okay. Go ahead. So then, do you think that's like an inclusio in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs? Um, I would pull up just a little bit short of that because they're not back-to-back -back books. We have a couple of books in between, but I'm going to talk about the larger relationship a little bit later. Right? Great question. Okay. Fear of Yahweh means humbly submitting to one far greater than us, mindful of the consequences if we don't. All right, so I'm going to be very forthcoming with you. Throughout my life, and I've been, by the, by the power of the Spirit, I've been trying to walk in fellowship with Christ since I was about 17. Okay. Um, there have been times in my life when I have not indulged in some particular sin simply because I knew God would know and he wouldn't let me get away with it. That is the fear of Yahweh. I know sometimes we kind of um, give that a cosmetic change and call it reverential awe and I'm not saying that that's completely wrong but I don't think that's the real heart of it the real heart of it is we all need to to read the lion, the witch and the wardrobe when they ask is he a tame lion and the answer is no he's not tame but he's good all right. The fear of Yahweh means I have such a high view of him that I sometimes don't sin because I expect that there will be consequences. Now that worked for you when you were a kid growing up with your parents. There were times when you might have wanted to get away with something and you decided not to do it because of what mom or dad would do when they found out. Right? That's the fear. Now, that's the beginning of wisdom because it will keep you from making all kinds of really stupid choices with life. 
on the other hand it's not the end of the matter because as we read in Peter perfect love casts out all fear when we are motivated to do the right thing and avoid the wrong thing because we love God and we cherish our relationship we don't have to be afraid okay so it's not like like one is true and the other one is not they work um, they work kind of like a piece of fruit being held in front of the nose of a mule while at the back end there's a whipping stick which would you prefer to go forward toward the fruit or to be smacked on your backside all right. Both of them are necessary for people, well, for people like me. I won't say about you because I don't know all of you that well. Okay? Questions or comments or confessions? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so here's a meme. Two of the greatest qualities to have in life are patience and wisdom. And you see the skunk getting into the dog food <laughs> and the dog having the patience and the wisdom not to mess up. All right. <laughs> or how about this one? Foolishness, according to Proverbs, according to the Ketuvim, is not playing by God's rules or acknowledging His rule there are consequences built into nature. And part of growing up is learning the consequences of things from the time that you're very, very small. Um, falling down on hard objects hurts. This kind of animal can bite. We learn from the consequences what to do and not do. Some people are quicker learners than others. Okay. Um, probably all of you can think of stories or illustrations of this. There's certainly too many flooding my mind right now, just as a parent. Um, when kids don't play by the rules you've set down, and why do you have to make me keep punishing you? All right. Um, it's built into life. So much so that this doesn't even necessarily have to do with the fear of God or being a Christian or anything else. This is universal. Some people seem to just notice how the world works well and live cooperatively with it. And others attempt to live life against the grain of how God has made things. And here, I mean, this has far-reaching uh, 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 far consequences. Things like food and rest and, you know, all the other practicalities of life. And sometimes we just make foolish decisions. All right, I'll tell one story, a quick one. Um, when I was a student at Multnomah, which is where I teach now, but I was an undergrad student there. When I was a student, night after night after night, uh, we would have dinner time. And, and dinner time, the way it was served back then was you all sat down at a table and you were expected to sit there together until you were all collectively dismissed. And I would get bored. I'd finish my meal pretty quickly and would sit around the table just chatting and drinking coffee. Three cups, four cups, six cups. Who's keeping track? I would drink all this coffee and uh, then almost every night I would go to the gym and I would go work out. I'd go most often play basketball. And I'd play until the gym closed around 10, 15 or so. 
And I'd go back to my room, take a shower, hang out with my friends, and prevented them from doing their homework until about midnight when they finally gave up and went to bed. And somewhere right around there, I started my homework. And I would do my homework till however long it took and then get up just in time to make it to my eight o'clock class, okay? Um, but when I went to bed, I found, found out that I couldn't sleep. Now, I had never connected caffeine and sleeplessness in my head. I was convinced I was a high energy person who needed very little sleep. I did that for three years straight, getting by on two to four hours of sleep a night. About a month after I finished as a student, I found out that I had what appeared to be stage four cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I found out I had a 20% chance to live two years. Now, I don't think that you could say, and I wouldn't say, coffee causes cancer. But I would say, if you, through lack of rest, deplete your immune system for three years in a row, it should come as no surprise that your body can't fight off what it normally fights off. I live stupidly, and I've suffered the consequences of that. Now, obviously, God let me live beyond two years. It's been more than 10 years now. <laughs> okay, it's been 45 years. But I've had consequences. My whole upper body was irradiated with old school cobalt radiation and I have damage to all kinds of organs and I've had more heart surgeries than I can remember right now and I have a chronic cough and all of that's due not to coffee. It's due to radiation treatments circa 1970. Um, I'm paying for my foolishness. All right. If you're wondering, no, I don't drink coffee anymore. And it's not because I don't like the taste. It's because it wires me, always. Right. Um, <laughs> Tamara, go ahead. <laughs> Please don't tell them the rest of the story. And I don't even know what you're thinking. <laughs> it's, it's because you married a woman who said lips that touch coffee will never touch mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was another incentive. <laughs> I don't know if you all picked that up, but <laughs> when we got married, my wife does not like coffee, and she said lips that touch coffee will never touch mine. <laughs> so that was enough to solidify the decision. <laughs> okay. All right. What else about wisdom? Well, here's some of the cause effect the rules that I'm talking about. <coughs> Lazy hands make a man poor. Doesn't matter what continent you live in or what century. This is transcultural, isn't it? He who takes crooked paths will be found out. Sooner or later you're going to get caught if you're a deceitful person. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. The higher up you are, the further you're going to fall. A kind-hearted woman gains respect, but ruthless men gain only wealth. Now, some of you ladies might be sitting there a little too smugly right now saying, I knew us women were a lot better. Now, this is not a gender thing. Just insert person. A kind-hearted person gains respect, but a ruthless person, all they get is money. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. He who brings trouble on his family will inherit only wind. 
Be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous will go free. Okay. This is the kinds of rules for life that work everywhere. Living wisely leads to well-being and prosperity. Living foolishly leads to failure and destruction. Right? This is a continual message. And again, this is not just in Proverbs. I see it all the way from Psalms through Chronicles, that is, the first and last books of the writings. Proverbial wisdom assumes unity of life. Uh, what I mean by that is this. In, say, the book of Ecclesiastes, you read about things that are sacred and profane, clean and unclean. In the book of Proverbs, there's not that kind of distinction. All of life is completely enmeshed. So these aren't just spiritual rules or rules for living the spiritual life. It's living the holistic life, every dimension of our being. Okay? And that, again, I would see true as being, uh, I would see that as being true for all of the Ketuvim. There's no religious versus secular. It's all the same world. Uh, so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read the, the phrase, uh, it's what's called the Shema, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. And it says, it goes on to say, you shall teach this to your children and lists out all the different activities, and I can't remember them all from memory, but teach them when you are lying down, when you're walking along the way. Really, in all your activities, be teaching your children this Torah. Interestingly, in the book of Proverbs, we have the same kind of speaking here. So look at chapter 3 for a moment. Uh, chapter 3, by the way, in Deuteronomy it says, you shall bind these to your foreheads and to your, your hands. And Orthodox Jews to this day wear what's called phylacteries that contain the Shema on their foreheads. You might have seen pictures of this. And on their hands. And some of us think, oh, you Jews are taking this so literally. The point is, in all of your thinking, in all of your activities, may they reflect obedience to the Torah, the teachings. Okay? All right, chapter 3 of Proverbs, verse 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. That was the same thing that was said of God's word, the Torah, back in Deuteronomy. It's now being said of the um, advice, the Proverbs of the Father to the Son. Chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 20. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Remember I told you about parallelism? how two lines work together. Here's, listen to your father and your mother. Interestingly, that second line, do not forsake your mother's teaching. You know what the Hebrew word for that is? Torah. It's being given the same kind of authoritative status as the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> and your moms are all thinking, yes, I know. My word is law. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Bind them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. Again, that sounds just like Deuteronomy. Chapter 7. Verse 1. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings, my my the plural of Torah, Torte. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. 
Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Okay, let me just make a, a quick comment here. Um, guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. If you look up the phrase in Hebrew, there's no word for apple in this verse. Um, apple of the eye is an English expression and it's been used in almost all English translations as an equivalent. But really the idiom is the little man of God's eye. Little man, what is that? Okay. Now, because I know her a bit better, I'm going to infringe on Cassie's personal space here. <laughs> All right. Yes. All right. No. Not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. Mm. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> We got close enough that I could see the reflection of my face in her pupil. And she could see her face in my pupil. Isn't that way cooler than the apple of God's eye? We are the little man of God's eye. He wants a relationship so close with us that it's pupil to pupil. All right? That's, a, to me, a very moving metaphor. He says, <laughs> that's how you should love your mom's teaching. That's how you should love wisdom. Thank you. Proverbial wisdom is a worldview, a theory of everything, how you're supposed to relate to everything. How are you supposed to treat your neighbor? Check out the book of Proverbs. How are, so, how are you supposed to treat your pet dog? It's in the book of Proverbs. Uh, how should you manage your land, your finances? It's in the book of Proverbs. How should you manage your sex life? It's in the book of Proverbs. All these practical things are here in Proverbs. Or actually, I should say the entire Ketu V. Truth is discovered by observing how the world works. Not by command, thus says Yahweh. You don't read that phrase. Actually, throughout the Ketuvim, you don't encounter that phrase. But advice. Listen, my son, to your father's teaching. Because a wise father is one who has observed the world long enough to know what works and what doesn't, what kinds of things you should do and should not do. Wisdom is about noticing and contemplating patterns in life. Those who do this are wise. And some people, I think, are particularly gifted at seeing connections between things. And that's a kind of intelligence that doesn't come through necessarily in schoolwork at all. What is a really, really important characteristic for living successfully. So some people notice things about bugs and other very small creatures, plants. Okay? And I've seen some of Cassie's artwork as she is learning wisdom from the world in which God has placed us. Right. Proverbial wisdom is practical. It's not, what does God want? But really practically, what should I do to be happy and successful? So its focus is on the life here and now, not the afterlife. So you don't see very much mention of um, life after death. Actually, in all of the Ketuvim, you see just a little bit in Job, just a little bit in Psalms, just a little bit in 
Proverbs and in Kohelet and in Daniel. But in most of them, it simply doesn't get mentioned. Proverbial wisdom views life as either or. So it's not either sacred and secular. It's not that divide. It's a different kind of divide. In Proverbs, the big divide is wisdom and foolishness. People who see the connections and try to follow according to the patterns that God, <coughs> <coughs> that God has built into nature or people who reject those things. <coughs> so in Proverbs, there's two ways. And another metaphor, there's two women. And one of them is Lady Wisdom. And if you pursue Lady Wisdom, it will lead to blessing. But if you pursue the other woman, the harlot, the prostitute, foolishness, it will lead to the opposite of blessing, which will be a fruitless life. It will be cursing. It will be cursed in that sense. Now let me just mention something real quick. Uh, I'd love to have way more time to do this, but uh, in the first nine chapters of Proverbs, we see a lot of uh, uh, discussion of lady wisdom and the characteristics. And we all take that to be metaphorical, right? So um, lady wisdom is personified as a person. Wisdom is being personified as a person. Okay. Does that mean that the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs is for women's studies? <laughs> or is that really for everybody? Well, it's for everybody. Okay, can we agree on that? Okay. So if anything, it's about the son who is choosing wisely which kind of woman's allure he is going to be attending to wisdom or foolishness. So it's an everybody introduction. And the reason I want to emphasize that is because how the book ends. So, how many chapters are there in the book of Proverbs? There's 31. I could ask you about how many chapters are in any number of books and you might not know the answer. But almost everybody knows the answer to this one. Why, are you, why do you know that there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs? Because of the Proverbs 31 wife. And that, of course, is how women are supposed to live. Right? Right? Wait a minute, what do we do with the first nine chapters of the book? We come to Proverbs 31, and what happens is women go have their Bible studies, study the passage, and feel like, who is this woman? And does she change her clothes in a phone booth the way Superwoman does? Who can possibly do this? I mean, it sounds like she gets up about three hours before she goes to bed at night <laughs> and she does everything in the home doesn't the, doesn't a guy ever do anything right. so it, unfortunately for many women it's discouraging it seems like the job description is beyond their grasp meanwhile guys read that passage Proverbs 31 and they say that's the woman I'm going to marry and that's how they apply the passage to their own life personally. Is to find her and have her do all that work for you. Okay. Um, I'm being a little facetious here, but only a little. I really think that Proverbs 31 is about the same woman as Proverbs 1 through 9. It is Lady Wisdom. And that Proverbs 31 isn't a female exclusive passage but rather we should be all attracted to wisdom and therefore 
we should hear it more frequently at men's retreats because men need to know who to chase after lady wisdom and not foolishness okay any thoughts here size of relief In, um, in, at the beginning of Proverbs 1, it said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And then in chapter 9, verse 10, it says the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Uh, is there, is, is there <coughs> a difference or is that two ways of saying the same thing? Or? Yeah, I think especially when we are reading in Hebrew poetry, we will see words coupled together to have one single idea expressed through multiple words. And we Westerners tend to break things up and say, oh, this is wisdom, this is knowledge, and parse things out that way according to our two categories when it's supposed to be a single comprehensive picture. And so we could have insight or discernment or prudence all being used in the same semantic range to communicate the one bigger idea. Good. Others? Okay. In proverbial literature, wisdom is supreme. Her price is far above rubies. All right. Value wisdom at the expense of all kinds of other creature comforts and material goods. In proverbial wisdom, it's supreme. Nevertheless, it has its limits. Now, we don't learn that from the book of Proverbs. We learn it from the book of Job. We're going to learn it again when we come to Ecclesiastes. Okay. All human wisdom, this side of eternity, is going to be flawed. So that Paul, very wise man in his own right, says uh, that he knows in part. What are some of the prominent themes? And here I broke down a chart. And no, I don't expect you to read all the way through it and memorize it all. But these are the main themes, and I highlighted which books these themes are particularly prominent. Wisdom and blessing versus foolishness and its own consequences. Royalty or king. There's a lot of royalty through all of these books. Fidelity in marriage. The blessing of work. Female imagery. There's actually a lot in here, and that could be a, a whole night's discussion in itself. Um, creation imagery. Human suffering. Godly character and the fear of Yahweh. These are some of the main ideas, really, of Psalms through Chronicles. Okay. What's the canonical context? What's going on in the storyline? Well, here we are in this section of the writings, and I take all of this to be essentially proverbial. What's the context? <laughs> it's the same as the entire Ketuvim, the writings. The people are in captivity awaiting the coming of Messiah to rebuild the temple and establish the kingdom. Now again, I don't know necessarily when each of these books was written or by whom. They were put into a collection, an order. And I think that we are intended to read in a sequence, in an order. And where we're at in the story is that the people are in captivity. Okay. 
Proverbial wisdom is universal. We'll see the importance of that in just a minute. In other words, it doesn't matter your nationality, the time period, or the culture. Proverbs work. If I were a missionary, I could certainly see spending time in Proverbs because you'd have the least amount of explaining to do of the whole big story and it's just so portable. I, I like to think of it as practical wisdom to put in your suitcase. Regardless where you go, Proverbs works. It works the same everywhere, always. Therefore, it doesn't mention laws, temple, sacrifices, covenants, priests, patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those. Moses, prophecy, Jerusalem, the messianic seed, miracles, God appearing or speaking directly. Think especially here of the book of Proverbs. What do you learn about the priests from the book of Proverbs? Zip. What do you learn about the Jerusalem? Nothing. What do you learn about the promises of God made to David and Moses and Abraham? Nothing. They're not even mentioned. Okay. Come back to that again in a moment. Why? Why are important themes ignored in proverbial literature? And here's my answer. Because the people are out of the land. They're not under the Davidic rule. They're not under the Levitical order of sacrifices. They need rules for how to live when the covenant seems to be off. No wonder we have no mention of priests and prophets and kings because that's not part of their lived experience now that they are in captivity. Okay. Questions or thoughts here? <coughs> Quick aside. <coughs> um, <coughs> there's a lot of people who look for a central idea to the entire Old Testament. And the ideas are things like the covenant or the kingdom of God or uh, any number of other proposals. Salvation history or something. Uh, most of those big ideas work really well except when it comes to this literature. <clears throat> because those big concepts are simply not discussed at all. And no one would ever say, well, I think that the main idea of the book of Proverbs is the kingdom of God. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I've referred to it as the Bermuda Triangle of Old Testament theology. It's where otherwise good theologies go get lost. Right. <clears throat> Colleague of mine, Vern Steiner, an Old Testament scholar, says this, on the surface, Proverbs appears to consist in a random collection, a willy-nilly stringing together of practical, traditional, and obviously secular tidbits on daily living, on managing money, mouth, might, morals, and marriage. That's cute, huh? It offers good suggestions, but its accent is moralistic. Its organization, disjointed, its teachings sometimes contradictory. Its theology not especially profound. Its promises too sweeping. And its tone, well, listen to your dad's advice, huh, boys, hardly compares to the prophetic, thus says the Lord. Now, uh, in his defense, I have to say, Vern Steiner does not believe this about Proverbs. All he's saying is that a surface look might make it appear this way. A deeper look is going to yield far uh, better in the insights. Okay. <clears throat> so, is there a structure to the book of Proverbs? 
I think here's one. Uh, you have a hermeneutical introduction, well, the prologue, and then a hermeneutical introduction, which is the first nine chapters. And then we have, well, within that, we have Lady Wisdom versus the Adulteress. And then we have a discrete section, which are Proverbs of Solomon uh, from 10 through 2216. And then we have 30 sayings of the wise in 2217 through chapter 31. Actually, I could break that down. We have anonymous ones. And then we have Agur. And then we have Lemuel's mom. And we have an epilogue of the noble woman. Quick comment here. The, the woman, noble woman, is how that section in Proverbs 31, verse 10, how it starts. Ashit Chayil, a woman of character, a woman of virtue, strength, honor, respect, all of those together. Ashit Chayil. Um, who can find her price is far above rubies. All right, keep that in mind. Unique style of proverbial wisdom. It showcases the author's wisdom. Vivid, creative, concise, memorable, clever. Um, you have to be wise to understand it. The wiser you are, the more you appreciate what they are doing. It appeals to common sense. You can't argue with what everyone knows to be true. And it just seems to just have the, the voice of, look, anybody who's wise has got this figured out. It also teases. That is, it invites further thought rather than closing thought. Let me give you an example. There are three, three things too wonderful for me. Four, which I cannot understand. The way of an eagle in the air. How do they do that? They're not even flapping. And have you ever tried to pick up one of those things? They're almost as heavy as a turkey. These are big things. How do they stay in the air without flapping? That's beyond my ability to understand. There are three things too wonderful for me, four of which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a snake on a rock. How does a snake go? Well, you know, it just crawls on its belly. Okay, hot shot. You get on your belly and try to go like a snake. There are three things too wonderful for me. Four that I don't understand. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a, a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the sea. How does a boat stay on top of the water? You try stepping on water. Does it support you? No. Which is heavier, you or a boat? Well, how does a boat stay on top of what? I know, we've got fancy terms like displacement and all of that, but it's still a pretty remarkable thing, isn't it? There are three things too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of, um, I just lost the last one, uh, the ship on the sea, and are you ready for this? Drum roll. <laughs> the way of a man, young man around a young woman. <laughs> the end. <laughs> and you're saying, wait a minute. Um, what are you talking about? What are we talking about? Some of you ladies might be thinking, well, okay, I can see the similarity between the young man and a snake, but no, no, you're missing the point. 
How is that wonderful? And so we walk away not with a kind of smug answer. We come away with a question. We're pondering and wondering. And what kind of a person would think up a proverb like that? Kind of interesting, isn't it? It often leaves it up to us to figure out the moral of the story. And that's the dangerous thing. Because even a really well told parable can go right over people's heads. But if you tell them what the moral of the story is, then all the wonder of the story goes out the window. It's like you've just performed uh, a dissection of it and killed it in the process. It describes what is usually true in life. They're not guaranteed promises. So let's see, I think it's in chapter 20. Yeah, in chapter 26, back-to-back Proverbs. Do not answer a fool according to his own folly, or you'll become one yourself. Next proverb. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Well, those can't both be simultaneously true, right? Right? Well, how would you know which, when to do which one? You'd have to be wise to begin with. Sometimes it's better not even to try. Other times, if you don't, if you don't respond, you're responsible for not having helped them. Okay. Wisdom describes what is usually true but not always. Wisdom is, is a form of knowing that is, <coughs> excuse me, that is essentially personal, relational, and experiential. Wisdom demands dialogue, debate, interaction, disagreement, mistakes, learning by apprenticeship, and most important of all, the adaptation and tempering of knowledge to specific human purposes. In other words, it's best pursued along with other wise people. Communally. Get around other wise people. So, what does that have to do with our canonical context? What are you supposed to learn from the book of Proverbs for living in captivity? For living this side of Christ's second coming. Life goes better when we live wisely. We should seek wisdom, wise counsel, and thoughtful reflection. Okay? That's the most important thing. Wisdom starts by fearing God. And it works anywhere in every situation of life even and perhaps most helpfully when we're living before the final establishment of God's kingdom like we are right now. So that's the book of Proverbs. Okay. Any last questions before I move on? Okay. You now have the rest of your life to ponder this. Let's move on to the book of Ruth. Ruth, I'm going to assume that you guys are, are familiar with the basic storyline of it, so I'm not really going to repeat that part. Ruth is right here after the book of Proverbs. <laughs> uh, what theological lessons can we learn? And I'm going to call it Seeing Truth in Ruth. What truth are we supposed to learn? First of all, Ruth is a narrative example of the noble woman. 
Do you remember how I said that the Proverbs 31 lady in 31.10 starts off with the phrase, Asha Chayil, this woman of character, of valor, of strength, of integrity. That phrase is only found in two books of the Bible. The book of Proverbs, the book of Ruth. And it is exactly what Ruth gets called. So turn with me to Ruth. <clears throat> In chapter... Uh, Three, yes, chapter three. Um, Boaz is talking to Ruth. And in verse 10, he says, The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. Look at this next line. All my fellow towns, uh, townsmen know that you are an Ashit Chayil. In other words, the book of Ruth gives us a narrative example of living wisely. Now, Boaz calls her an Ashit Chayil, but Boaz himself is a very wise person. That's why I don't think Proverbs 31 is just a woman's passage. Boaz is living it out as well in his Torah obedience. R Ruth trusts in God and is committed to his people. So remember at the very beginning when Naomi um, is, is leaving Moab after 10 years and the death of her husband and both of her sons. Her two daughters-in-law want to come with her. And she says, no, no, no. You guys just, you go back home. And Orpah does go back, but not Ruth. And the funny thing is, it actually took Naomi 10 years of living in in Moab before she finally returned why did she wait so long? I don't know. I think there's lessons to be learned actually from that. That when we feel estranged from God, the best thing to do is to return to Him as quickly as possible. All right. Ruth wants to come. And she says, no, you're better off here. And Ruth is insistent. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And do you realize that Ruth is actually showing more commitment to the Israelite people than Naomi has for the last 10 years? She's showing more trust in Yahweh to protect her. Now, if you know the storyline, you know about the relationship between Moab and Israel. Is this a good move on her part? Actually, the beginning of Ruth starts off. In the days when the judges ruled, what do we know about the days when the judges ruled? It's a terrible time. As I'm reading this to students in my class, I force them into audience participation. I said, I want to hear a good groan. In the days when the judges ruled, oh. Oh, there was a famine in the land. Oh. And so a guy by the name of my God is king, Elimelech, decided to move to Moab. 
Moab of all places that's the worst possible do you realize that the book of Judges starts off with the king of Moab oppressing the people of Israel how do you think a Moabite woman is going to be received into that culture all right here's the best I can come up with as an analogy two years after the end of World War II in 1947 a young Jewish couple decide to leave their home in Toronto and go establish a new home in the small Polish town of Auschwitz How do you feel? You're one sentence into the story and it's like you're overwhelmed with the circumstances. That's what we have in the book of Ruth. She follows Naomi's God and Naomi's people better than Naomi does. But she ends up um, submitting to what Naomi even says once she gets back to the land. An important contrast. In Proverbs, the foreign woman is lady foolishness. The foreign woman entices the son away from wisdom. But here, Ruth, the foreign woman, is referred to as the Moabite seven times. They often don't even mention her name. They just say, you know, the Moabite and it's like you can feel the bigotry the stereotyping coming through even in the narration but she's characterized as a godly woman the book of Ruth demonstrates the importance of returning to the land when outside the land when they were living in Moab they faced death and barrenness the Hebrew word for return is also the same Hebrew word for repent. It's shuv. So, um, that word appears 15 times in the book of Ruth. Quick question for you. Why do you think repeating the term repent return would be a topic of concern for people living in captivity yeah because they are now in a Moabite that goes by the name Babylon or elsewhere in captivity what should they learn from the book of Ruth go home get right with God return Boaz is an example of faithfulness in the messianic line he is a Torah observer in the book of Leviticus they weren't supposed to harvest clear out to the corners they were supposed to leave a margin on the on the very perimeter for others especially foreigners to come and glean and he does that and he shows kindness to the non-Israelite alien which is what they were supposed to do according to Deuteronomy and he follows the pattern for lever marriage remember that part of the story where Ruth having lost her own husband would go to the next closest uh, surviving male relative. Um, and all the closest male relatives, well, the brother, she's a widow, the brother of the widow also died. So now who? And there's some other guy who's not even mentioned by name. And he's next in line. And Boaz ends up kind of <laughs> 
he is a very shrewd bargainer. He ends up convincing the other guy to give up his right both to the family property and also to Ruth, the Moabitess. Well, the guy's probably thinking, look, Naomi's son married a Moabitess and he died. And her next son married a Moabitess and he died. And here's Mo, uh, here's Boaz saying, oh, by the way, you get to have this woman as your own wife. What's he thinking? <laughs> no thanks. I actually prefer life. So that's how Boaz pitches the whole thing. But he's following the right pattern because that other guy was next, next in line. And he even goes through the formal uh, channels properly. Why is that important? Because Boaz is following Torah right down to the letter at a time when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. He pops out in the book of Ruth just as much as Ruth does. You could even call it, I suppose, the book of Boaz. So what do we learn from the book of Ruth? It starts off in the days when the judges ruled. Israel had no king. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Here in Ruth it says, in the days when the judges ruled. Okay. How does the book end? And here I have to have you turn to this. Because this is a book which for all of its popularity and yes, women's studies. This is a book that has a surprise ending. Um, so they go to uh, back to Judah, to, to Bethlehem in particular. And there Ruth and Boaz eventually um, get married. Chapter 4, verse 13. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went into her and Yahweh enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to Yahweh who to this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. Hit pause button. Who are they talking to? Naomi. Don't call me Naomi. Call me... Call me Mary. Uh, call me Mara. It's the same name. Which means bitterness. And they come and say to her, Look, isn't this great? God did not leave you without a kinsman redeemer. Who's the kinsman redeemer? Boaz, this shining example of character at a time when no one else was, a, was a faithful. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer, and this phrase, kinsman redeemer, appears a whole bunch of times in the book of Ruth. Okay? We're now in the last few verses. He's not left you, Mary, without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Good old Boaz. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Wait a minute. Did, did Ruth just give birth to Boaz? No, that's her husband. Who did Ruth just give birth to? The kinsman redeemer. There's all kinds of books and studies that show how, how Ruth and Boaz is like a picture, a type of Christ. But it's not Boaz who's the kinsman redeemer. It's the kid, the baby. Verse 36. Then Naomi, or Mary, whichever, took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. Who just went through hard labor? 
This was not Naomi. It was Ruth. But these women, again, here's this bigotry. They're not even congratulating mom. They are only talking to Naomi or Mary, whatever. And they're saying, look, Naomi or Mary, whatever, has a son. By the way, what was the town that she went back to? Oh, yeah, Bethlehem. Remember that time when Mary went to Bethlehem and ended up having a baby? Miraculously? I'm sure it's just a coincidence, all of that. Okay. They had a baby. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And we're all thinking, well, cool. But if we're reading in our English Bible, we have just finished the book of Judges, and now we read the book of, of uh, Ruth. We don't meet David until 1 Samuel chapter 16. You have no idea who David is. But if you're reading in the Hebrew order, you read 1 and 2 Samuel a long time ago. You know who David is. And then we have this genealogy at the end, which, you know, all things considered, um, it's a lame way to finish a love story, isn't it? It's like being forced to sit there and watch all of the movie credits before you're allowed to leave the theater. So we're rolling the credits at the end of the, of, of the story here. I suppose that's one way you could approach it. But let me give it to you another way. <clears throat> Verse 18. <clears throat> this then is the family line of Perez. Perez? Who's Perez? Perez lived way back there. He was the son of Judah. Okay. Here's the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of of Hethron. Hethron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Ami Nadab. Ami Nadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of <laughs> David. And the crowd erupts and goes wild. <laughs> What's the climax of the book? David. In the times when the judges ruled, there was no king. What were they looking forward to? A king. And Ruth says, Here's the background, the story of when Mary went to Bethlehem and a little baby kinsman redeemer was born that brought us to David. And we are thrilled by the book of Ruth, which is cool as a love story, but it's even cooler when seen as all these other things. Okay. So, the book points us toward the future redeemer, the real Goel, kinsman redeemer. The real kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth is not Boaz. Instead, it's the child who is born that will lead us to David. God wants to redeem even Israel's enemies, Moabites into his plan in fact not just his plan into the very line of Jesus so much for a pure family tree oh and by the way you know who Boaz's mom was what's that Rahab Rahab the harlot 
Canaanite woman who was rescued from Jericho. Wow. We have all kinds of curiosities in the genealogy of Jesus, don't we? And Matthew highlights five women. Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and who am I forgetting? Uh, ultimately, Mary. Bathsheba. Oh, Bathsheba. Yeah, yeah. Who, by the way, was married to a Gentile. Uriah the Hittite. Okay? So it looks like God's plan is actually to include people who aren't Jewish, who aren't Israelite. Instead, according to Paul, we get grafted in. And we have an example of the grafting of Gentiles into the people of God as far back as these stories. So here's my chart for the whole book. Uh, and let me just uh, kind of zero in on what I take to be the main idea of the book. An excellent character is rewarded by God's blessing. Excellent character, that's the next row. How is that seen in each chapter? The blessing that's given, how each is seen throughout the whole book in each chapter. And then we have the plot and the setting, which is the easiest way to divide up the book. And I've chosen as kind of a key verse, the very last one. Boaz, the father of Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. And that's what the book of Ruth is leading us toward. So, here we are here. Here's another glimpse at a section of the writings. <coughs> Psalms and Chronicles share a number of things in common. We're going to talk about that later, especially when we talk about Chronicles. <coughs> but at the very least, both focus a lot on David and on Temple and on the Torah. And then we have the book of Job and Proverbs. Then there's five books. They're called the Megilot and then Daniel and Ezra Nehemiah. Now Megilot is a term that comes from Jewish tradition uh, not from the scriptures themselves. Slightly different ordering and it really has to do with the Jewish calendar and when these books were read. So these were the five books that were read at feasts at the beginning of the, of the festival year and then you have the Song of Solomon read at Pesach. Then Ruth at Shavuot and notice that in the Hebrew Bible, they're in the opposite order. And then we have Lamentations. And then we have Kohelet or Ecclesiastes. And then Esther. Although in the Tanakh order, it would actually be Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, then Lamentations, then Esther. But anyway, these books, five books, have been read together annually by Jews for centuries. I don't know if this is the most helpful grouping though. Because if I go back and look at the Hebrew ordering here, I see something going on like this. You have the book of Psalms, which has 70 plus laments. Kind of going along with the book of Lamentations which is all about lament. And you have the book of Job and Ecclesiastes or Kohelet and both of those are a little bit more skeptical about pursuing wisdom. Wisdom is good. Wisdom is, is important but wisdom has its limits. And nowhere do we find out the limits of wisdom as much as in Job where he never has his questions answered and in Kohelet 
where all of this uh, striving for wisdom seems to elude his grasp. And you have the book of Proverbs and Song of Songs, which are both at least Solomonic in the name being attached to the book. There's more similarities than that. <laughs> okay, I'll jump ahead. Uh, so the description of Lady Wisdom in the first nine chapters is a lot like the description of the lover in the Song of Songs. Okay? And there's one pivot point. Ruth. And Ruth kind of brings in patriarchs and promises and Torah and other things that are missing in the rest of these other writings. Okay. So, what does that teach us about how to live today? Repenting or returning to God is always the right thing. I don't know where any of you are at in your own walk or relationship with God, how intimate that relationship is, how long it's been since you last really talked to Him, listened to Him. But if it's not all that it's supposed to be, don't hang out in Moab for years. The most important thing is make it right. Shuv, repent, so that you can shuv, return. And God wants to redeem even our enemies. Do you realize God loves Moabites? Who are the Moabites in your life? God has a plan for them too. A lot more to say about that later. And our hope is for a coming deliverer. Not just for little D. David, the son of Jesse, but the ultimate David, the son of God. So that is the book of Ruth. We didn't quite get to Song of Solomon. I'll pick up from here next time and we will give that book its proper attention. It looks to me like we're finishing right about on time. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you that your ways truly are far above ours and that rather than becoming depressed about the fact that we're not omniscient, that you gladly give of your wisdom to those who ask of you in faith and that you do so uh, joyously and uh, liberally, as it says in the book of James. Uh, help us to be people who pursue your truth and bring glory to you and health to our own soul's well-being as we do so. We pray in the name of our Goel, of our kinsman redeemer, Christ Jesus, our Savior, the Son, King, Suffering Servant. Amen. Good night, everyone. Record.